declare his glory among the nations. God is to be man's glory. And man is to be God's glory. Tonight we're going about to get into the word and study three days and three events. In the life of a man who celebrated the declaration of God's glory beyond anybody else except Jesus Christ. And that man is David. Let's go to day one in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Our first point, youthful obsession to declare God's glory. In verse 8, Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he was a fight and kill me, we'll become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On the hearing of the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Right here was Goliath the giant, nine feet tall. He came out every day to defy the armies of Israel. And he says, here's the deal. You send out your champion. I'm the champion of the Philistines. Whoever wins, wins the entire battle. And then the whole nation is subservient to the other nation." Well, it so happened that one day, David's father sends him to send some food to his older brothers that are on the battle line. And we read this beginning in verse 26. David asked the man standing near him, What will be done for the man who kills the Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, This is what will be done for the man who kills him. Then Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the other man. He burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now what have I done, said David? Can't I even speak? Well, we can see right here that little brother got under the skin of big brother. Happens in about every family, I think. And David came on down, and he looked at the situation. He saw Goliath, the champion of the Philistines, and he says, what is going on here? This guy is disgracing the God of Israel. And his older brothers rebukes him. And he mistakes the idealism of David. He mistakes his faith for conceit and for arrogance. Well, Saul hears about David's desire to go fight. He even brings him to him and offers his armor to him. Of course, you know, Saul was the Lord's anointed, and he was head and shoulders above everybody else. It really should have been Saul going out to fight Goliath. But instead, it was David. And all Saul could say to David in verse 37 was, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then we read in verse 40. Then David took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of a shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bare in front of him kept coming closer to David. Now let's stop right there. It's a dark moment for Israel when everybody in the army is shuddering at Goliath the giant and no one dares go fight him. And some people might think, well, now everybody's getting excited because finally David is moving out to confront the Philistine. Oh, no, 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 no. You see a 16-year-old kid who's going to fight a nine-foot giant, and if he loses, you're going to be a servant? Let me tell you something. It's gotten a lot darker right here. Verse 42. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me as sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistines, 
You come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. Today I'll give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and threw it from the scabbard. After he killed him, he cut off his head with a sword. When the Philistines saw that the hero was dead, they turned and they ran. Right here, we find that David goes down to the stream. And I'm sure with a lot of prayer, picks out five smooth stones. And in some ways, the idea of going against somebody with a slingshot was nothing new. But you need to understand, not only was Goliath imposing by Sai. But the helmets of that day only left a slit right above the eye as an exposed area that was a target. It would take a miraculous shot to hit the right place. And so you see the giant coming towards him. David reaches into his pocket. He finds a stone. He starts revving it on up and boom. He gets it, boom, it hits him, and he just totally is stunned, and he crashes down. Now, he's not dead right here. David runs up, takes out Goliath's sword, and then hacks off the head. Now, you know, thick guys, it takes a little bit to get through all the muscle and the bone right there. After he hacks off the head, he just lifts up the head like this, and all the Philistines run for cover. Later on, it says that neither Saul nor Abner even knew David's name. You see, at this point in his life, he was a no-name idealist. See, I believe there are five smooth stones of idealism. Number one, no gray. To David, everything was black and white. Either someone was circumcised or they were uncircumcised. Either they were of God or they were not of God. Number two. There was no compromise. Yes, his brothers did not want him to fight. But he says, listen, God is with me. And no one, absolutely no one will stop me from standing up for the truth and standing up against this uncircumcised enemy of God. Number three, he had no fear because he believed that God is with him. Number four, he had no price. There was no price. There was no backing down. And number five, there were no impossibilities. That is the power of youth. It's idealism. Are you with me right here? You know, that little line on verse 46. He says, today, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And the whole world will know there's a God in Israel. David was going to evangelize the world all by himself. Everybody was going to know about the God of Israel. Turn to Acts chapter 19. In Acts chapter 19, Paul too realizes the value of youth. We find he's at Ephesus. In verse 8, Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became opposite. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and in discussions daily in the next hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. This is incredible right here. The province of Asia is what we would call the western edge of modern-day Turkey or the western edge 
of Asia Minor. That area is far bigger than any state in America. And the Bible says that in two years' time, it was evangelized. Everybody had heard. Is that awesome, church, or not? Well, what can we glean from this passage? Well, we need to understand the methodology of Paul. Number one, as a leader, he targeted the most influential city of the province, which was Ephesus. And seeing how it was influential, the flow of influence would flow to all the rest of the province. Now, we understand how powerful that flow was from reading the book of Revelation. Who is the book of Revelation primarily addressed to? The seven churches of Asia. In other words, during this two-year period, those other six churches were initiated by disciples originally there at Ephesus. That fire you want up right there. Number two, we saw that Paul imitated the methodology of Jesus, which is to have small evangelistic groups that work together. Not just to convert individuals, but to convert other groups that would be able to establish small groups of disciples in other cities. And of course, we understand that is like a Bible talk or a house church. Amen, guys? You know, one of the new things about our movement is not only that one disciple makes another disciple, but we believe in one church planting another church that plants another church that plants another church. Are you with me right here, guys? Interestingly, though, where does he decide to start his effort with the Gentiles? In the lecture hall of Tyrannus, campus ministry. He wanted to be with the young people. Young people who were unencumbered with the baggage of their life and their sin. People that could just go to another place in a snap of a finger. You know, it's very interesting to me that the principle of going to a city of influence and all the other cities knowing about it is ultimately had at the very end of the book of Acts. At the end of the book of Acts, we find Paul in Rome, the most influential city in the entire known world. And Paul writes from Rome in prison in the book of Colossae. He says that every creature under heaven has heard. In the first century, the world was evangelized in a generation. Do you believe it can be done in this generation? In many ways, you could say that churches like Ephesus and Rome and Jerusalem were, so to speak, like pillar churches upon which the entire brotherhood would be built. And so if we're going to evangelize the world in our day, we're going to have to do it the way that Paul did, the way that Jesus did. We're going to have to, number one, target the most influential cities. Number two, we're going to have to work in small groups evangelizing every day. And number three, we are going to have to redouble our efforts on the college campus. Are you with me right here? You know, the challenge of building a worldwide brotherhood in some ways it's very simple. The concept is. See, we believe that if you have a group of disciples that is unplagued by lukewarmness and sin, but through confession and openness of life, they stay pure in their commitment to Jesus Christ. One disciple makes two disciples. Two make four. Four make eight. Eight meet 16. And you can multiply throughout an entire city. Amen, guys? But the challenge is to keep the base of disciples pure. Too often in our today's society, we confuse weakness with lukewarmness. To be weak is someone that still wants to be a disciple. Someone who's lukewarm is no longer trying to be a disciple. And they will stop the multiplication of disciples. You know, right now, I believe there are about 15 churches that need to be planted as pillar churches. That if we could get to these pillar churches, we could build a brotherhood that would go around the world. 
so that any disciple could go to any city and be greeted by fellow disciples and see the same commitment, the same love, the same spirit, and the same hope. You know, in Los Angeles, we came to Los Angeles to plant the church here because Los Angeles has 20 million lost souls. There are 700,000 college students. Wow. We're going to New York, and we're excited about that, amen? New York has 20 million lost souls and 500,000 college students. Chicago, 10 million lost souls, 200,000 college students. London, 12 million lost souls, 180,000 college students. Paris, 10 million lost souls. 300,000 college students. Moscow, 11 million lost people. 450,000 lost students. Cairo, 15 million people. 200,000 college students. Lagos, 14 million people. 200,000 college students. Johannesburg, 5 million lost souls. And 100,000 college students. Tokyo, 28 million lost souls, 300,000 college students. Mexico City, 25 million lost souls and 300,000 college students. Sydney, 5 million lost souls and 100,000 college students. And India's got 1.2 billion people. China's got 1.4 billion people. And let me tell you, they got a whole bunch of college students. We need young people to be converted off our college campuses that are ready to go on mission team as mission team members and then mission team leaders so that we can establish these pillar churches. Are you with me right here? Some say, well, why do we have to go to a city that already has an ICOC church? I remember a very similar question was asked back in the 1980s when we were in Boston. Why, Boston Church, are you sending a new church into a city where we have a lot of mainline churches of Christ? The same question was asked almost 30 years ago. And the same answer applies. Because there are so many lost souls. There are untold millions dying untold. The mainline Church of Christ, every person they baptize that's a faithful, true disciple, we need to say amen to. Every person the ICOC baptizes as a faithful disciple, we need to say amen to and rejoice with them. Those are just two less people we got to get to and evangelize. At this point, the mainline church does not embrace discipling. At this point, most of the ICOC has rejected discipling. And that's not to say that there aren't some churches that are doing it. Same thing back in 1980. There were a few mainline churches of Christ that were really doing it. But they weren't a movement. The mainline church was autonomous. And so this group was going this way. This group was going that way. This group was going this way. This is where the ICOC is gravitated to. There are a lot of awesome kind and wonderful people in these churches that actually are trying to baptize people. But now that they have gravitated to a doctrine of autonomy, one church goes this way, one church is that way, they have totally surrendered movements. In order for there to be a proclamation at the end of this generation that the world is evangelized, we need to understand that we need to have a movement. Are you with me right here? You see, we need an, a youthful obsession to declare God's glory. No gray, no compromise, no fear, no price, and no impossibilities. And that goes for you old people, too. You know, a brother that I love with all of my heart that embodies all the David-like youth is Lance Underhill. Lance and Connie is one of our shepherding couples. 
And they came to our Jubilee in Portland a couple of years ago. Lance came and he saw the church and he goes, wow, everybody's a sold out disciple. That doesn't mean everybody is perfect. That doesn't mean we don't have some weak brothers and sisters, but everybody is striving to serve the Lord. And everyone believes that the world can be evangelized in our day. Lance, Lance was so fired up. He went to the campus there at Portland State. Vic Jr. showed him around. Vic goes, hey, see those people over there? That guy's studying with that guy. And he was just baptized just a couple weeks ago. See those girls over there? That girl and that girl were baptized, and they're studying with that girl. He just went around, and they saw the whole campus ministry doing exactly what we see right here in Acts chapter 19. Lance got so fired up, he went home to Connie in Florida. He says, son, we've got to move to Portland. Our souls depend upon it. We're in a lukewarm church. we got to go. Connie says, listen, we own two homes, and we're absolutely not going. Three months later, their youngest, they had four kids. Three had already fallen away. Their youngest says, I don't want to go back to church. It's boring. It's dull. I don't want any part of it. Lance calls up. He says, Kip, we're coming. By January 1, Lance and Connie come. Joey starts going back to church. And a month later, he baptizes his friend, Josh Smith. Is that awesome or not? When we were coming down here to the LA mission team, Lance goes, bro, can I please be on the mission team? I said, bro, you know, we need some strong people stay in Portland. He says, bro, I got to go. My son, Michael's down there. I said, well, what's the situation? Well, it's tough. Michael's a bartender and he's living with his girlfriend. Now, he used to be an intern, but he fell away because he felt no one loved him. So I said, okay, you're on the team. So we came on down, we started studying, and in the first month, Mike was restored to the Lord. And he's now our youth minister in the City of Angels Church. <laughs> then about a year later, he had had his son, uh, son-in-law, Jason, come to Portland and move on down with his wife, Alyssa. Alyssa had previously been baptized, but after studying the Bible, she saw that she really wasn't a disciple. And so, just a few months ago, Alyssa was baptized into Christ as a disciple. And now, three of the Underhill kids are in the fold. Amen? One more to come, and the last one just got out of the army. He'd been serving in Iraq, and he is due to move here this fall. And let me tell you something. The Underhills and the church are ready for him. Amen, guys? Now, you've got to understand... We have the ideal to win the world, but we especially have the ideal to win our families. And if we're going to win our families, we better have churches that our, that our family members who maybe have rejected the Lord go, wow, I am just so pulled in by the love. I am just so pulled in by the commitment. Yes, I want to turn my life over to Jesus Christ. Bottom line, Lance left everything. That same youthful no gray, no compromise, no fear, no price, no impossibilities. And God is blessing his youthful obsession to declare the glory of God. Amen, church? Amen. Day two. We're going to end up in the cave of Adalim. But we need to stop off for a little bit here. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 21. Our second point is lonely intercession to declare God's glory. Lonely intercession to declare God's glory. You know, after David slew Goliath, he became the greatest of generals for Saul. Every time he went out, God gave him the victory, and the people recognized it. He became the best friend of Jonathan, the oldest son of King Saul. He also married and fell in love with the beautiful younger daughter of Saul, Michal. As a matter of fact, he was real fired up because Saul said, because he wanted David killed. He says, okay, the dowry for getting my daughter is a hundred Philistine foreskins. David got 200. He made sure he got the girl. Amen, guys? In the midst of all of this, there was a song that the people composed. 
And the song went something to the effect, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Interestingly enough, this song is recorded three times in the book of 1 Samuel. It's recorded one time right after he slays Goliath. The other two times are recorded when an outside king remembers that this was the song that was sang about David. But that song galled Saul. He got bitter. He got jealous. He got so full of hate that he tried to kill David three different times. In a short period of time, David has an incredible fall of being the greatest general, the best friend to the heir apparent to the throne, the son-in-law to the king, to outlaw. And we pick it up in chapter 21. David went to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. Ahimelech trembled when he met him and asked, Why are you alone? Why is no one with you? David answered Ahimelech the priest, The king charged me with a certain matter and said to me, No one does know anything about your mission and your instructions. As for my men, I have told them to meet me at a certain place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or or whatever you can find. Right here, we find that David has no friends, no food, and no money. And he hasn't done any sin. But God has allowed him to fall from the greatest general to a lone outlaw. It's kind of interesting. We find later on in verse 7, Now one of Saul's servants was there that day, detained before the Lord. He was Doeg the Edomite, Saul's head shepherd. David asked Ahimelech, Don't you have a spear or sword here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon because the king's business was urgent. The priest replied, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Eli, is here. It is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There's no other sword but that one. David said, There's none like it. Give it to me. Evidently, when David had had the great victory over Goliath, he presented to the Lord the sword of Goliath. And now the Lord was giving it back for him for use. Amen? Does that sound like your contribution? There's some things that I didn't quite get that that, that excited me as I studied this text. Number one, it's clear with the high priest being at Nob, which is just a short ways from Jerusalem and Gibeah, that this is where the tabernacle of God was at. This is where the high priest is at. This is where the people would come and worship. But we also find that the ark now has been in Kiriath Jarum for 40 years. The ark is the presence of God. So you have a tent that people come to worship, but the spirit isn't there. Secondly, Doeg goes and tells Saul, hey, I saw David conferring with Ahimelech because he was the high priest. And of course, David wanted to know, what does God want me to do? You can read in chapter 22 in the midsection from 9 following that Saul calls Ahimelech and all the 85 other priests to him. And he says, why were you helping out David? And he slays them all. He not only kills all the priests of God that served in the tabernacle of God, but he went and killed all of their wives and all of their children. Now, there was a second high priest who escapes, and he goes to be with David. A third insight that I got was a passage that we use a lot to inspire each other about loyalty, and I still love it. It's the story about the three mighty men going at the whim of David to get some water at the well of Bethlehem. And it never hit me. It says, there was a garrison of Philistines there at Bethlehem. Oh my gosh. What was going on in Israel? It was crumbling both spiritually, there was decay, And it was crumbling, it was physically shrinking. 
and the Philistines were slowly overrunning it. And we know that when God is with his people, they are always victorious. Amen? And so it's a clear sign. With the spiritual decay, the empty tabernacle, the spiritual decay, the eradication of the high priest and all the other priests, the shrinking, the geographic shrinking of the territory. There was a crumbling of Israel because of unspiritual leadership. And the people loved it that way. It is into this setting that we read chapter 22, verse 1. David left Gath and escaped the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. All those who were in distress or indebtedness intended gathered around him, and he became their leader. About 400 men were with him. You know, David goes to the cave with nothing. Nothing except his God and the sword of Goliath. At the cave of Adullam, he writes Psalm 57. Let's look at it. Look at this. First one. This is, this is incredible. Have mercy on me, O oh God. Have mercy on me. For in you my soul takes refuge. I take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. And this is a, it's a cool little Hebrew expression. The idea of being in the shadow of the wings has two concepts. In the ark itself are two cherubim, two, two angels. And each angel has wings that are pointing up. And when the high priest would go in, he would talk to God, who would be seated on the mercy seat right between the angel's wings. So the angels represent protection and direction. Is that cool right there? I'm in the shadow of your wings until disaster has passed for protection and direction. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. David knew even when he was all alone, God had a purpose. I love that passage in Acts chapter 13, verse 36. It said, when David had fulfilled his purpose in that generation, he fell asleep. And I always take soul. Of course, falling asleep means he died. So that means until David died, he had a purpose. And you know, a lot of us have been through a lot of hard things over the past few years. But here's the good news. Check yourself out. Have you died yet? If you've not died, God has a purpose for you still. Does that excite you or not? You may be, you may be all alone. You may be feeling like you're in the cave of Adullam. But God has a purpose for your life. Look at this. He sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. He sends his love and his faithfulness. I'm in the midst of lions. I lie among ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp arrows. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Wow. He declares the glory of God amongst the nation at the triumph of the battlefield, and that's awesome. But perhaps more awesome is declaring the glory of God amongst the nations when he's all alone and he has nothing. See, that's what got David through. David did not have a small God. God, in his mind, was a God whose glory would spread over all the nations. That was the God that David served. You know, we need to, I think, be very blunt here tonight. We are here because of only one thing, the mercy of God. We are here because God has allowed us to be here. It was the mercy of God 
that David was allowed to be at Adullam, to be all alone, to connect with his God, and then get ready for the things that would come. You know, over the past five years, that which we call the kingdom, the movement, the ICOC, has been crumbling. There's been spiritual decay and physical shrinking. Many of our churches have become like empty tabernacles. That's what Jesus said about lukewarm churches. And you know, we all believe that we follow Jesus, amen? We walk in his steps and we speak his words. He says, those whom I love, I rebuke. Jesus didn't call out the church of Laodicea because he was down on them. No, no, no. He called them out because he loved them. Now, I think part of the problem is sometimes we're calling out individuals and we're calling people and we're not saying with a lot of love. But the whole concept of the church of Laodicea is that Jesus is knocking. He's outside of the church. The spirit has left. And he wants back in. You know, a very powerful thing happened in Santiago with Raul and Linda Moreno. They took a stand for the new movement. Amen, guys? And it was a costly stand. It cost so many of their friendships. But they wanted to honor their God and glorify him amongst the nations because they believed in having a movement. And to be a movement, you got to be moving. Movement implies numeric growth and geographic expansion. That's not happening in the ICOC. Even our own statistics for the last two years is two years ago they lost another 17%, and last year they lost another 11%. That's where things are at. However, in the midst of all the chaos in Santiago, Raul was strong, but Linda, frankly, was very confused. Because she had many friends in the ICOC that she loved dearly and, and it nurtured her in the faith and done a lot of great things for her. And so she was pulled both ways. She, she loved the brothers and sisters of the new movement, but she loved the brothers and sisters in the ICOC. She was pu pulled both ways and it really confused her. It paralyzed her. Then one day, she got a call from two girls that she'd helped convert in a city in Florida. And they called her and says, Linda... We've decided to leave the church, and we're going to a Pentecostal church. Now, several of the leaders in that church in Florida had been her friends and her mentors. And people that Linda was confused about. But then, when she had now other friends that were leaving, because they said, we just can't find the Spirit, she turned to Raoul and immediately says, now I know why we need a new movement. I've got to go get my friends. The ICOC lies in ruins as it's given up the dream to evangelize the world in a generation. Many amongst them actively say, it is impossible, and Kip is a false teacher for teaching it. Now, you've got to make a decision. Either it's possible to evangelize the world in a generation like our first century brothers and that's what we need to do or it's impossible and let's not do it and let's just have little community churches. Autonomy is where everybody has their own little kingdom and that's why so many preachers get taken out by sin. I still remember back in the olden days in the, in the 80s we're trying to pull the movement together. We actually started as, you know, out of the, the mainline churches. And so the churches, like the first two churches like Boston and Chicago and New York and London, we, we, we were autonomous. And then we started reading the scriptures about that there was ongoing discipling, that, in fact, Paul discipled Timothy well into his mid-30s. There was direction that one evangelist gave to another. And we were trying to pull together the old work sectors. I remember traveling down to talk to Mike Tolliver in Sao Paulo, and I said, Mike, we're trying to pull everything together and have each people in world sector so we can organize the evangelization of the world. 
I said, here's the deal. You can either be with, with Steve, but if you're going to be with Steve, his, Steve's charge is going to be Africa. Or you can build under Phil, and his charge is going to be Central and South America. Now, I'll never forget what Mike said. He says, and he said this kind of mockingly mad. He says, I can't believe it. Right when I get my own kingdom, we change the game. Oh, it was very recognized back then. And what produced a movement were people who were willing to submit to other people, not because they were perfect, because certainly we weren't, and the final outcome certainly proved that. But at the end of the day, it took that kind of walk with God to be secure. There was a God who declared his glory among the nations. You know, uh, I'll never forget what happened in Hilo. Kyle came to the Jubilee in 2006, and he says, hey, this is awesome. This is what I want. Kyle just became the minister there at Hilo. The church in its heyday had 60 disciples, 100 on Sunday, and they were doing great. But then over time, with all the things that happened, the church came to about 35, 40 members on Sundays. And I asked Kyle, well, how many do you have on Wednesday? He says, well, about, about 12 or 15. I said, well, bro, that's your true church right there. He says, bro, we want you to come on over and preach. I said, okay, bro, but you check it out with the leaders. He went back to the shepherding couples. They said, yes, we want them to come. Ali and I come. And there was an active confrontation at that point. There was an evangelist, ICOC evangelist sent from L.A., and an ICOC evangelist sent from Honolulu. And they actively fought our discipling, the Hilo Church, even though the Hilo Church wanted us to disciple them. Now, this church hadn't had a baptism for a year. Hadn't had a baptism here. Those brothers came. They said, listen, if you don't want to be a part of what Kyle and Kip are doing, we'll start another church. Now, this is interesting because they had even taught that starting a new church was sin, but they started the second church. Even right now, we still disciple the Hilo International Church of Christ, and Evan Bartholomew is leading it. Now, at the end of the weekend, at the end of the weekend, there are only 12 members of the Hilo International Church of Christ. But you know, what can 12 sold-out disciples do? They can turn the whole world upside down. Amen, guys? They hadn't had a baptism for a year. In the next year, even Kyle, without any training, had 20 baptisms in that church. I mean, it shows. When you have sold-out disciples, you can multiply disciples. Are you with me there? Now, at that very time... There's another couple that used to be in the ministry, Joe and Mary Santos. They said, listen, we want, to, we want to start another church over here in Honolulu. So they started just the two of them. Can you imagine starting a church, just the two of you? They started. They've sustained it. I mean, the Lord has blessed them. The remnant group got the 14. We just sent a mission team over from Los Angeles with Kyle and Joan Bethamu of 10 disciples. And now we have the Honolulu International Christian Church And here's the thing, guys. You need to understand. We need to just lay it out right here. The old Honolulu church used to have 1,000 disciples with 1,500 on Sundays. That that church has 200 people now on Sundays. They've only had three baptisms each of the last few years. They believe in autonomy. They do not believe in discipling. How are you going to evangelize the white lands? Are we saying there are no disciples in that church? No, there are disciples in that church. But it is not a church that is a collective of sold-out disciples. It's not going to be the multiplying of disciples. We rejoice at the three baptisms they had last year, but that's not going to evangelize the Hawaiian Islands. Even in the first month that Kyle and the group have been there, there have been four that have been added to the body of Christ there in the new church. Are you with me right here? You see, what began to happen with David is that people started coming to him. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 22, that the distressed, the in debt, and the discontented gathered around him. It, it didn't hit me. Well, what were they distressed about? They were distressed about Israel. They were in debt because they were so poor because of the Philistine occupation. 
And they were discontented. They were being driven out. As a matter of fact, probably David's parents left Bethlehem, yes, to join David, but because the Philistines had overrun it. That's why they came. Now, the amazing thing is, these men become what we call the mighty men of David. Now, we need, we need to just understand some things right here. From one person's point of view, David was divisive here. David was in the vast minority. Everybody disagreed with him. Now, the amazing thing is, he didn't invite these guys. They heard about him, and they came. Can you imagine? I mean, David, as he got stronger spiritually? I mean, David was no one for his singing, amen? And he's in a cave, and, and you know, if, even if you're a bad singer and you're in the shower, you sound awesome. You know what I'm talking about? Can you imagine being a cranking singer like David? And singing? And talking about the glory of God? His prayer songs? My God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with whiz. Dumb power and love, our God is an awesome God. And the guys then knew where to find him. They followed the singing. The first couple of guys came and they hugged. It's just like at our churches when people come from across country to join the sold out disciple movement. I mean, we're fired up because we're few in number. Are you with me right here? And there's some others that said, listen. I'm in distress, I'm in debt, and I'm discontented, and I'm ready to be a part of something that's going to change the world. You know, in some ways, you know, when you look at things right now, you you may say, hey, there's not much going on, but God is working in a great way, amen? Let's go to our third and last point. Day three. The ark comes to Jerusalem. Point three. A bloody procession to declare God's glory. Ultimately, we're going to end up with the ark coming to Jerusalem, which probably was the most glorious day in the life of David. To be able to have the very presence of God housed in a new tabernacle there in Jerusalem. In Samuel chapter 1, we find that Saul has died. And the Bible says that David took up a lament. And it says in verse 19, he talks about Saul and Jonathan. Your glory, O Israel, lies slain on your heights. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath, proclaim it not in the streets of Ascalon. Lest the daughters of Philistines be glad. Lest the daughters of the uncircumcised rejoice. Verse 23. Saul and Jonathan in life were loved and gracious, and in death they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. O daughters of Israel, sweet for Saul, who clothed you in scarlet and finery, who adorned your garments with ornaments of gold. How the mighty have fallen in battle. Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You are very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. How the mighty have fallen. The weapons of war have perished. You know, right here, I believe echoes the words that that Steve spoke to us this morning. I think sometimes we look at some of the brothers that have done incredible things in the past, and we see them doing quote, comparatively, a lot less, and we hold them in disdain. That's not not the heart of David. Here's Saul, who united the tribes. Now, granted, it began to crumble, but there was a time the young, idealistic Saul united the tribes and brought the glory of God to Israel. And David takes up lament, not only for his best friend, Jonathan, but for Saul. Most of you in here, if you're remnant people, owe your soul to someone who's not in here. And if for no other reason than that, you need to have a heart that glorifies what they did for God. Amen? Turn now to chapter 3, verse 1. 
The war between the house of Saul and the house of David lasted a long time. David grew stronger and stronger while the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. You know, a lot of people say, well, where in the Bible was God's people ever divided? Well, <laughs> right here is one of them. It's right here. And the Bible says that the house of David grew stronger and stronger. It started with one guy in a cave. One guy in a cave, and now it's the house of David against the house of Saul. And of course, Saul had three sons killed, but his son Ishbosheth now was reigning in the house of Saul. And there was a lot of war. There was a lot of blood right here. You know, uh, just think about it right now. Our young movement is less than two years old. And look at this room. Is this incredible, guys? In two years, this is what God has done. Now, amazingly, the Lord has now blessed us to have, unbelievably, 14 groups in America and 17 churches internationally. That's in less than two years. The church in L.A., we just started 15 months ago. In those 15 months, the Lord has blessed us with 121 baptisms and 62 restorations. That shows the Spirit of God is with us. Are you with me right there? Now, chapter 5, we find that Ishbosheth is killed and Israel and Judah unite under the kingship of David. Once he becomes a king, he goes out and obliterates the Philistines once and for all. Once he obliterates the Philistines, he knows, you know something? What I need to do now is consolidate to have a central government and to have a central place of worship as the Bible taught. And so this then sets the stage for chapter 6, which is the ark being brought into Jerusalem. Let's read it quickly. Verse 1. David again brought together out of Israel chosen men, 30,000 in all. He and all of his men set out from Bala of Judah to bring them from there to the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim that are on the ark. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Stop right there. The ark had literally been there at the house of Abinadab for 50 years. Saul didn't use it but one time, chapter 14. That's the only time he used the ark. All the rest of the time was there. How did it get there? Well... Israel lost its glory under Eli. The Philistines had it, and then they wanted to get rid of the ark because God smote them with a bunch of tumors. And they just sent the ark back to Israel on a new cart. And so the Israelites just kind of think, well, I can learn from the Philistines. We'll just kind of take it on a new cart up to Jerusalem. Well, let's see what happens. Uzzah and Ohio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it. And Ohio was walking in front of it. David and the whole house of Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord, with songs and with harps, lyres, tambourines, systems, and cymbals. When they came to the threshing floor of Nikon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down, and he died there beside the ark. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, that place is called Perez Uzzah. Wow, can you imagine it? David is so fired up, he's finally going to unite Israel with a central government and a central place to worship. He is so fired up because Israel has been plagued with tribal animosity, tribal jealousy, tribal autonomy, all the way back to the book of Judges. And now he was bringing everybody together here in Jerusalem. And what happens? They're riding along, they have the Ark of God, and one of the guys, quote, Good intentionally, when the, the oxen stumbled, the ark was starting to fall off the cart. He grabs it, and the Lord smotes him right on the spot. Here's what we need to learn. A lot of times we use the expression, God is with us. And that's good intentioned. But that's really not the issue. As a matter of fact, that can be a false feeling and actually a false thought. The issue is, are we with God? See, this was what the angel confronted Joshua with before he began to fight the battle of Jericho. See, right now, a lot of people go, well, 
there's the ICOC side, and then there's, you know, the City of Angels side. And they say, which, which side are you on? Well, the song we sing, whose side are you fighting on, is not talking about which of those two sides, guys. <laughs> Joshua sees the angel coming towards him with the drawn sword, and he says, whose side are you on, ours or enemy? And the angel of God says, neither. Now take off your sandals, because you're on holy ground. See, we need to understand, the angel wanted to set Joshua straight. It wasn't that God was going along with Joshua and company. It was that Joshua and company was going to go along with him. And we are not a movement that chooses to be a movement of men. We have said, this is what we believe from the scriptures. We believe that God commands us. And the example is in the scriptures that we need to evangelize the world in this generation. We believe that the church, the visible church, needs to be composed of only sold out disciples. Now we understand there are disciples that are saved in other churches. The mainline church and the ICOC churches. But they're not all sold out disciples and so they can't be a movement. They're not going to multiply. They're autonomous. That is their form of government. They've gone back to the mainline Church of Christ theology. How much so? Almost every church in America has changed from, say, the Chicago International Church of Christ to just simply the Chicago Church of Christ. That's how much they've embraced mainline theology. Now, our convictions is not to be down on them. And I think being very straightforward here in preaching to us, we got to cut that out. We are no better than them. Many of them have done a lot more than us. And yet the whole thing is, we want people to join us. You don't get people to join you if you're down on them. You get people to join you if you say, listen, I appreciate the good you're doing, but here's what we believe the Bible teaches. Now, come and join God in our crusade to evangelize the world in this generation. Are you with me? We don't have time to go there, but in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, 13 through 15, David has a three-month hiatus where he parks the ark, and during that time, he reads the scriptures and finds out that the ark was, A, to be carried by Levites, and two, the purpose for the rings on the ark was you were supposed to have poles in there. So in other words, you need to learn from your mistakes, amen, guys? And, and we need to learn from our mistakes. And, I, I can tell you, as one of the worst sinners in the old movement, I'm telling you, when everything came crumbling down, my life included, you can't point fingers at other people. You've got to say, hold it. What is God trying to teach me? <laughs> Two lessons that came home to me. The, the, the biggest one is that people idolized me, and I loved it. And you know what God does to idols? Smashes them. And God smashed me. Secondly, one of the weaknesses of my ministry was taking care of the weak. When everything came on down and everything was ripped away, I was so confused. I was so down. I was depressed. I mean, Elena would try to get me to go out at night. I didn't want to go anywhere. I was just so down, so depressed at seeing everything, quote, I had worked for being destroyed. And secondly, I was full of a lot of bitterness and full of a lot of self-pity. And I started asking, what am I doing? And on top of all this, people were criticizing me, criticizing my ministry, criticizing my ministry style, criticizing Elena, criticizing the kids. I mean, the kids' name was trumpeted in almost every church around the world. It just kills you. But you know, I go, this, this hurts so bad. And I said, hey, just give us a little mercy. None was given. I go, okay, God, I got the point. You want me to be a merciful leader. See, that's how God teaches you. And you need to learn your lessons. And you need to understand that the healing that God gives 
It's not through time, but through repentance. I had to repent of my bitterness. I had to repent of my anger. I had to repent of my self-pity, and I had to say, listen, I want to learn what I did wrong, and I want to go forward, and I want to build a new movement that's going to evangelize the world in this generation. Are you with me right here? We find that David then, after three months, wants to take the ark. And so we read this in verse 13. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fatted calf. Now this is incredible. For several miles into Jerusalem, every sixth step that the Levites took with the ark of God, another bull was slain. The blood gushes out. The whole road to Jerusalem is paved in blood. Is that intense or not? Now look what happens here. David, wearing a linen ephod, danced before the Lord with all of his might. Well, he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. As the ark was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from the window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. Do you know that word despised is exactly the same word that talked about Goliath being despising David. Now the love of his life despised him. Well, let's see what happens. 17. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in place inside the tent, and David had a pitch for it. David sacrificed the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. Verse 20. When David returned home to bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today disrobing in the sight of slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. David said to Michal, It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. And Michal, daughter of Saul, had no children until the day of her death. You know, it's an amazing thing to me, this setting right here. It says at the very end, McCall, daughter of Saul. In other words, it doesn't say McCall, wife of David. It doesn't say McCall, daughter of Jonathan. It says daughter of Saul. In other words, she was like Saul. What was the issue right here? Well, some commentators think that when David was dancing, he was only wearing a linen ephod. He was wearing nothing underneath it. And when he danced up in the air, kind of like DJ Lee's singing, you know how that is, he exposed himself. And she was filled with horror. I mean, bottom line, he's wearing this cruddy linen ephod instead of the kingly robes. And he's dancing like a buffoon out there in front of all Israel. And she is so upset. She's so upset. She doesn't wait to greet David when David comes inside the house. She goes out to meet him. And she lays him on out. You know, I wonder how many marriages have this same dynamic right here. That one of the partners is fired up for God. But you despise their zeal for God. You despise them. You hate it. Everything they do just grates you. And the same word was spoken of McCall that was spoken of Goliath. Wow. Bitterness will take us out. You know, at the very end, when he got there, he wrote this psalm. We'll end with 1 Chronicles chapter 16. It's our last scripture. Verse 7, that day David first committed to Asaph and his associates this psalm of thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord and call on his name. Make known amongst the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him. Tell of all his wondrous acts. Going down to verse 23. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory amongst the nations, his marvelous deeds amongst 
all peoples. Verse 34. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Cry out, save us, O God, our Savior. Gather us, deliver us from the nations, that we may give thanks to your holy name, that we may glory in your praise. Praise be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Then all the people said, Amen, and praise the Lord. You know, for a lot of us, this, this mystifies us in the importance. Right here, this is the point that Jerusalem becomes Zion. This is the point that the people of understand that now God is with his people through the presence of the ark. You know, this jubilee is a very, very important time for us. I mean, hasn't it been great just to be together? Amen, guys? And it's a time where we're really shaping the direction of the movement. It's a time now where Elaine and I are trying to pull together kind of an inner circle. It's, it's really great having the Bordieres here and now the Untalons in town to be kind of shepherds of the church here and, and shepherds for the new movements. It's great to have couples like the Brooms and the Smellies and the Commonsfords and the Sullivans helping on out in that capacity. And we know that more and more people are going to be added to that, that group that helps give direction to the church. But, you know, you, you're seeing it before your very eyes. The creation, so do you speak, of a new Jerusalem. A place where we can all come together and worship the Lord. Are you with me right here? You know, one of the things that I think is so important is knowing where we're going. And so, last Tuesday, I read for the first time to a group of leaders what we're calling the five-year plan. You know, uh, amazingly, the discipling movement just began in 2006 in Portland. That year, we planted with a mission team Phoenix, it joined the remnant group at the Clopex. And now Phoenix is cranking. Amen, guys? That year, out of Syracuse, we sent a few disciples from Portland. The church was planted with the brooms in Chicago, and they're cranking. Amen? In 2007, we planted the Los Angeles church, and the Lord is really blessing us. In 2007, Raul and Linda came on back to us, and we got a cranking church of sold-out disciples in Santiago, Chile. Amen? Now, this year, we've already sent out the Honolulu church. This Sunday, we send out the New York City church. This Sunday, we send out the Washington, D.C. church. That's incredible. This is just two years into the movement. That's incredible. But here are the plans. First year, 2009. We're going to be having a new hope organization. The Bordieres are going to be in charge. They're going to talk about it tomorrow morning, and you're going to be excited about all the things that they're planning. In 2010, we're going to be sending to London 12 million people Michael and Michelle Williamson with a mission team from Los Angeles. Amen, guys? In 2010, we're going to be sending to Miami Raul, Linda Moreno, and Ken and Liliana Zindler. In 2010, we're going to collectively begin supporting an evangelist in India that's going to oversee all the Indian churches. Presently, we have four churches in India. Is that exciting or not? In 2011, we're going to go to Johannesburg with 5 million people with Chris Van Staten, a native South African. In 2011, we're going to be going to Mexico City, 25 million people with Vic and Aurora Gonzalez. When the Williamses bring a mission team to the remnant group over there in London, then Tim and Leanne Kernan are going to come back here to L.A. for a couple years so that in the year 2012, we will send Tim and Leanne Kernan to Paris, France with 10 million people because they're French speakers. Are you with me right here? And then in 2013, we're going to be sending Mike Underhill to Hong Kong to preach the word. During this time, we hope to have other U.S. plantings as well as to have new plantings in Sydney, Australia, Sao Paulo, Brazil, and Moscow, Russia. That's our plans for the next five years. Are you excited or not, church? You know what was, 
what was interesting, I read the plan and shared it Tuesday at the Zindler's house with all the leaders from around the world. And right at the end of sharing the plan, the house started to shake. I mean, it was incredible. It's not just a little shake. It started to shake. And we all thought of the same passage. Everybody starts clapping and starts shelling. Mike Underhill goes, and the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they went out and spoke the word of God boldly. Now, you, you have to make a decision. Was that just a random earthquake that happened to hit right at the end of the five-year plan? Or was that God? You know, I, I, I have to think, you know, the earthquake's magnitude was about a five with a five-year plan. My question is, what would have happened if we would have had a 10-year plan for God? Thank you, and God bless.